Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll call this regular city council meeting of the Sebastian City Council to order. If you would all rise for a moment of silence and keep in your thoughts and prayers, the victims of the senseless tragedy that we felt yesterday in Uvalde, Texas, and then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Council Member Dodd. Roll call, please. Mayor Hill. Here. Vice Mayor Jones. Here. Councilmember Dodd. Here. Councilmember McPartland. Here. And Councilmember Nunn. Here. Thank you. Uh, Council, uh, are there any requests for uh, modifications to the agenda this evening? All right, hearing none, we'll move to item six. Item 6A, um, we're going to go ahead and skip that down and we're going to go straight to 6B, uh, presentation by Indian River County Ship Program, John Stoll, who is the Chief of Long Range Planning. Mr. Stoll? Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm John Stoll, Chief of Long Range Planning for Indian River County. I'm also the ship administrator, uh, and I'm a Sebastian resident. Uh, today we're going to talk about the State Housing Initiatives Partnership Program, also known as SHIP. So we'll talk about what is SHIP, some of our local housing strategies that we use to help people out, and our new SHARP program. So what is SHIP? Well, SHIP was established in 1992 by the William E. Sadowski Act using documentary stamp revenues. And since 1992, Indian River County has provided over $20 million in assistance to folks. Uh, it's a partnership with the county, lenders, realtors, and nonprofit housing programs. Uh, we use our local housing strategies to help us meet our local housing goals that we decide on. Uh, these are usually resolved through 10 to 20 year forgivable loans. We usually do 10 for rehabilitation applications and 20 for purchase program. So these are some of our state requirements. Uh, we're required to provide a minimum of 65% of the funds um, on eligible home ownership activities. We have to provide 75% of our funds on eligible construction activities. At least 30% of our funds must be reserved for very low income households at or below 50% of our median income. Uh, an additional 30% of the funds may be reserved for low income households at or below 80% of the median income. And the remaining funds we can use for uh, our moderate income households and that's at 120% of our median income. So this is kind of our SHIP uh, public participation process. Our, the local government staff, that's the county staff, develops a local housing assistance plan. That's our guiding document every three years. Uh, we bring that to our Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Uh, the AHAC committee will review that and will provide comments. We'll uh, put those into our LHAP and then we'll bring it to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. The BCC will approve uh, our LHAP and we'll send it to state, uh, the state of Florida for their approval. Um, we also have a loan review committee, which is made up of three individuals. It's a county commissioner, our community development director, and a local banking professional. And they review all of our applications. Um, so there is some public oversight in that. So we're gonna get into our local housing assistance plan, which is our most important document. This details our strategies, our subsidy limits, and our eligibility requirements for our program. These are based on local housing needs and it allows flexibility at the local level. So the important thing to remember about this is that we're gonna give you enough to keep your house safe and healthy for you and also help you get into affordable housing. So I just wanted to put this up. This is a uh, table that's provided to us usually semi-annually. The state updates it based on local housing prices. You can see right now that a very low income family of four is classified at an annual income of 39,950. Um, we'll use this to determine what category you go into and how much money you're able to get from our program. So this brings us to our local housing strategies. Um, these are all the strategies we have in our local housing assistance plan. Um, the ones I've highlighted are the ones we use on a regular basis. You'll see that we do have a disaster mitigation loan. That's for hurricanes. Um, and we do have a new construction loan. That's more of a, a matching loan process where we work with a private uh, or a nonprofit developer uh, that wants to do an affordable housing program, we can provide up to $100,000 in assistance. So I want to get to the important ones. Um, well, one of our major ones is our owner-occupied rehabilitation loans. 
Uh, we can provide up to $60,000 to qualified individuals. Uh, we're usually doing these with uh, roof repairs, um, air conditioning, plumbing. You know, again, we're, we're always doing things to make th the house safe and healthy to live in. We have a purchase assistance with rehabilitation loan strategy, and that's where if you're gonna buy a house that isn't brand new, we can give you some money to make the house safe and healthy to live in, and also give you some down payment assistance. For this one, we can give up to $32,000. Um, purchase assistance without rehabilitation loans. So this is just a straight uh, down payment assistance. Um, we can up to offer up to $20,000 for these to help get people into homes. And then the one we're really dealing with a lot right now, and it's kind of eating up a lot of our time, is the emergency repair loans. We have a lot of copper piping and we have a lot of huge um, water leaks that are going on in people's houses. So we have to move these to the front of the line to help folks out. We can give up to $25,000 for those. Uh, additionally, we do have an impact fee and capacity charge loan. We can help you out with your impact fees um, if you're building a new house. So that brings us to our SHARP program. So this is where we're using supplemental American Rescue Plan funding uh, with our SHIP program to actually provide you a little bit of additional money. And so where I mentioned that the SHIP program is a uh, forgivable loan, the SHARP grant is just a straight grant that we'll give you. Um, right now, uh, for example, I, I mentioned the Rehabilitation Assistance Program loan. That's for six, up to $60,000. Additionally, we can give you up to $30,000 in an ARC grant. So we could get you up to $90,000 in assistance. And we've actually had to use that recently uh, to help someone out with their house. Um, additionally, we can give you, instead of just $20,000 for a loan for a down payment for a house, we can give you $40,000 now. And we provided an additional $10,000 for essential employees, such as teachers, first responders, and healthcare workers. Um, so that brings us to the end of my presentation. Uh, I've provided a few helpful links here. I can uh, get those to anyone that wants to contact me over at the county. And oh, I just wanted to pop this up. This is some of our before and after photos. You can see the condition of this bathroom. Uh, we were able to get that up to a nice clean state in the, ex the external part of this house. And now it's been repaired. So uh, happy to answer any questions or? No, it's outstanding. Uh, very, very good programs and hope the public has uh, taken note of that. Um, is there any way to uh, link the contact information uh, to our website? We can. We, 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 would do, we could do that. So anyone in the community who uh, could use assistance in repairs or down payments or, or any of those types of things, just go to, go to our website and uh, they'll find a link to your, your homepage. Thank you very much. All right. I, I would like to mention one thing and I want to repeat it. For all the people out there dealing with plumbing issues because of their copper leaking, he said that the SHIP program has money for you to apply to help with that up to $25,000. That's important. It's very important because it's happening a lot. Yes, it is. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Thank you. Mr. Nunn? I mean, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Uh, we do have one brief announcement. Uh, May 30th, we have Memorial Day observance. It will be at the park, Riverview Park, at Veterans Memorial, and the event starts at 11 a.m. So please attend. Um, we had a lot of brave men and women that gave their life for us to do what we do. So please attend if you can. Thank you. All right, amen to that. Thank you very much. Any uh, other announcements from Council? Okay, great. That leads us now to public input. At this time, we will ask anyone from the public that wishes to provide this council with any information that is not currently on the agenda, uh, we would ask that you come forward and you get about five minutes to, to let us hear your story. Um, I will also let everyone know that our rules dictate that we will not have any applause uh, or jeers or any interruptions of any kind during the meeting. Does anyone wish to speak on anything other than what's on the agenda tonight? Yes, sir. Way there in the back. Okay, good evening, Council. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here. Right. And uh, there's something I wanted to touch base with you guys, because I've heard some rumors in the going around that maybe somebody's not going to try to run for Council. Oh, yes, sir. Year. I'm going to have to get your name and where you're from. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. My name is Bob Steven. I live at 150 Concha Drive here in Sebastian. So... Uh, it made me think about what, what's happened here, and I'm still very active with the Indian River Lagoon and, and what we've got to do to fix it or not fix it, let it go. And uh, we've got a problem out here, and, and it needs to be addressed. So bringing back Robert Fulcrum's 
some of his readings, uh, everything you need to know, he learned in kindergarten, one of my favorite books. You know, we've got a mess, gentlemen. If you're thinking of leaving, don't leave until we clean up this mess. We've been poisoning this, this waterway for so many years that it's got problems that people aren't used to. You've got growths out there that haven't happened before. Killing it with more poison isn't the answer. We've got to start from scratch, and we've got to do a suck the muck out. There's a lot of muck in our canals, and we've got to give it back to Mother Nature and let it come back, because it will come back. But So if you're thinking about leaving the city of Sebastian's government, please, clean up your mess before you go. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Nice to see you at a council meeting. Anyone else wish to speak on something other than the agenda? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Louise Kottenberg, and I live in the city of Sebastian. I won't take too much of your time today because I know that you've got a very busy schedule, but there are some things that have come to my attention, and I, I, I know that you people are paying attention to it, but I want to make sure that everybody in the public is paying attention, too. Just a little bell. Forever, a bell has signified something that we need to pay attention to. From the Liberty Bell to the doorbell, to the little bell hanging around the cat's neck, or the jingle bells that we put on our baby's shoes. Railroad crossings have bells. The door op opening to the shop has a bell to let you know that something important is about to happen. You should pay attention. Recently, it has come to my attention, again, as it has over the past 20 odd years that I've worked on committees with the city, that the state of Florida prefers state control rather than local control. We don't hear about it very often, but this year, we have a governor who has come right out and said, don't worry, folks. Problems won't exist. The state will just take over. And I want you to know that he's not lying. I, over the years, have seen more and more instances where the local government has less and less control. And I want you to know that our freedom is being gradually taken away from us, and we're giving permission. I think you've all probably uh, heard the little story about um, the way to cook a frog is to put him in a big pot of cool water, set it on the stove at a very low temperature, and just, he won't jump out of the pot. He won't even know he's being cooked. And I like you all to know that if you're not careful, we're going to be cooked. So whenever you hear a bell, think there might be something I need to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate that very much. There's, this, there's some, some home rule warriors up here on the stage, and I can assure you that, that Tallahassee uh, knows who we are and, and, and knows that we're watching, and they know that we're going to make sure that they don't get a hold of that. Anyone else this evening? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Grace Reed, City of Sebastian. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, well, it's, it's starting a little bit early, but it's starting. Um, one thing I like to do is sit back, just kind of look at social media and just kind of just watch and read and just see what's going on in town. Sometimes I comment, sometimes I don't. But this is a season that seems to bring out the ugly in several of our Sebastian residents. I was really hoping that this year we could provide our opinions on social media without potentially using fake accounts or name calling. What I found was a shame that on some of the posts that I read, some of the name calling was coming from one of our own city board members. 
And also, that's all I'm going to say about that part, but uh, we have two items on our agenda tonight that are very important to both sides. <clears throat> I am hoping that everyone that is interested in these, this week's agenda listen to both sides, do research on their own, and make informed decisions. Some new residents, and even some established residents, may find that someone is feeding a lot of misinformation. The best option is to tune into the meetings through Zoom, or better yet, attend the meetings. During each segment, there is a public comment section. That is an opportunity to get a question clarified by people who know the answers. If you can't attend and really want your clarification and thoughts, reach out to one of our fine councilmen. They have the answers. I thank each and every one of you. And if you're really not going to run, we're going to miss you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Very good. We will move on now to item eight, which is the consent agenda. Council, what's your pleasure on item eight? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, recommend approval of the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion to second. Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Jones? Yes. Councilmember Dodd? Yes. Councilmember McPartland? Yes. And Councilmember Nunn? Yes. And Mayor Hill? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Item 9 is the committee reports and appointments. This evening we have one uh, appointment to make on a committee. It's the Construction Board, a very important board, and we have an opening for uh, the unexpired regular member engineer or architect position. Council, we have a very qualified individual in Joseph Harrison. Uh, he's a very impressive resume, and I would make a recommendation to appoint him to serve the term to expire 9-30-2024. Second that. Good? good. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Harrison. We look forward to your service. Thank you. Uh, next is public hearings, item 10. Oh, Mr. Right. Mayor, before you move on. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. It's just on committee reports. It's sure. just to make everybody aware that next week, the Indian River County Veterans Council will be meeting here in the Sebastian Chambers at 1.30. Oh. Usually it's down at the County Commission but then they like to rotate it and they're coming up to Sebastian. So if you want to hear about a great veterans group and what they're doing for other veterans, attend next Wednesday, 1.30. Thank you. That is awesome. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on uh, committees? I apologize for skipping through that. Nope. All right, hearing none, we'll move on to item 10, which is public hearings. We have a public hearing this evening, item 10A, uh, con uh, continuation of the second reading and public hearing of ordinance number 0-22-04. Mr. Anand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we, this is the amending code of ordinance section 86-46, providing for definition. Amending code of ordinance section 86-47, clarifying unlawful deposit exception. Amending land development code section 54-2-4.2, future land use map, open <coughs> paren, flume, closed paren. Designation and zoning districts by providing new land uses and clarifying zoning designation. Amending land development code section 54-2-5.6 industrial district open paren IN closed paren by adding criteria for new heavy industrial open paren HI closed paren districts. Adding land development code section 54-2-5.7 criteria for heavy industrial open paren HI closed paren zoning districts. Amending land development code section 54-2-5.13, industrial plan unit development, open paren, PUD, hyphen I, close paren, by adding criteria for heavy industrial, open paren, HI, close paren district. Amending land development code section 54-2-6.4, providing criteria for conditional use. Amending land development code section 54-2-5.2. Dash five dash two two point two adding definition amending section five four dash five dash two two point three adding land use classifications providing for severability and repeal of law and conflict providing for codification providing for scrivener's errors and providing for an effective date. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Carlisle. Yeah, Mayor, members of Council, this is this again is the second reading. It was continued from the May eleventh meeting, and at the previous, <coughs> at the first reading, there were. Uh, one change that the council asked us to make regarding 48 hours to two business days. So if you look on page 51 under F subsection 3, it switched it from 48 hours to two days, two business days. And on page 54B, sections 3 and 4, 
those also were changed at the request of council from three to four business days. And other than that, we'll, we'll, we'll answer any questions you may have. And Ms. Frazier is here if you uh, have any other further comments or concerns or questions. All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on the uh, a Code of Ordinances Amendment number of uh, Ordinance number 0-22-04? All right, hearing none. Council, any questions of staff at this time? Actually, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, move approval of Ordinance 0-22-04 on second reading. I second that. A motion second. Any more discussion by Council? All right, hearing on roll call, please. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Council Member McPartland? Yes. Council Member Nunn? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. And Vice Mayor Jones? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Council leads us to unfinished business. This evening we have, uh, on our unfinished business item 11A, we have uh, the discussion on the repairs to Fisherman's Landing. Mr. Carlo. Uh, yeah, Mayor, members of Council, as you are aware, we had a structural analysis done, and subsequent to that we had a forensic analysis done that showed some, some items uh, that were not evidently apparent, and so we've, we had our engineer meet with the forensic engineer and draft up some objects that could be done or some some uh, steps that could be taken to address some of the safety issues such as the under uh, washing of undermining of the concrete slab under the wooden floor which you wouldn't see unless you ripped up the floor so that that is one item and the other one is the buckling of the floor in the back when it was spongy when we opened up that floor to be examined it was some moisture wicking up into that from the subfloor creating the floor system to become saturated and creating an unstable floor and then the termite, termite damage which we've been dealing with for some time with termite control is safing up some of those beams in that back dining room area to allow for that section to open back up and then monitor the other items um, as, such as the roof which is recommended to be removed we know if we remove that roof we're pretty confident we'll find some pretty significant uh, repairs that need to be made so that we can uh, monitor that and, and move forward for some time and, and just monitor the building from that point forward. So the request to, today is to uh, ask for $50,000 to do those repairs and safe up some of the out partial structures that need to be removed or need to be safed up, the decking and also the uh, the undermining of the slab. And I'll, I, Ms. Miller is here as well to answer questions. Okay. But she's, she's put together a pretty substantial okay. synopsis. Yep. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and make a quick statement on this. You know, uh, I agree with Mrs. Reed. There's a lot of things that are said on social media, um, and there's a lot of passion about a lot of some very important issues in the city, especially when you're dealing with your livelihood, it's understandable, the compassion that's out there. Uh, but it's not all completely factual, and there's a lot of uh, things that are stated out there that aren't necessarily true. The city council has never had a discussion on whether or not we should remove crabby bills from Fisherman's Landing. We've always had the discussion as to what we need to do to make that building safe for the public. This is the public's building. It's owned by the public. It's owned by y'all. And we need to make sure that it's safe for y'all. But while doing that, we also know that it's your asset as well. So we have to make sure that every single citizen in the city of Sebastian who owns that asset is being done right. So we have to make sure that financially we do everything in a way that protects the citizens in this regard as well. So it's a little bit of a balancing act, but we have always from the first day said we're going to do everything we can to keep crabby bills in the Fisherman's Landing building, and we have done that. And now this evening we're not talking about having them removed from that facility. We're talking about taking steps to keep them in that facility while making sure the public is safe. That's what we're doing. That's what we've done from the very beginning. And for that reason, I will move staff recommendation and ask council to direct staff to go forward and spend up to $50,000 to make the necessary repairs to Krabby Bills uh, as outlined in the document provided. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you place a motion on the floor, we can't have public input. Yes, we can. We can do that. Yes, sir, we can. We That's can. my motion. And then public input will come after we get a second. All right. My second. I have a second now. But does anyone from the public wish to speak on this item where we're going to fix the building to make it safe for the public and allow crappy bills to stay in the facility? Yes, ma'am. 
And again, I want to, while she's coming up, I want to remind everyone, you have a five-minute time limit. We're going to go ahead and allow that five-minute time limit. We ask that you be respectful and not try to be too repetitive. But also, we also cannot have cheers or jeers uh, throughout this because we want everyone to feel very comfortable when coming up and giving a presentation. Yes, ma'am, you may go. Good evening. Karen Jordan, Sebastian. Uh, I'd also like to see, in addition to the 50000 uh, the rent cut to Krabby Bills. Because if I were the owner of this restaurant that you own, that I own, part of it was closed down. I think the rent should be accordingly. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Thank you. Give me a second to set up, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Pete Sweeney. I'm with the law firm of Block & Scarpa, 601 21st Street in Bureau Beach. And I have the pleasure of representing Susie Andrews as the owner of the, and the lessee of the building and the restaurant Crappy Bills. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the moment of silence. I think in as turbulent times as we, I'm a father of two, and it's been a devastating day, I think, for a lot of people. And to see a community come together, I think it's very important. I also want to compliment you. The last time I was here, I think it was near Veterans Day, and I think this council is made up of all veterans. And so with Memorial Day coming up, I want to compliment you. I think it's very important, and I appreciate your comment. But I also want to say that this is a very important issue. Obviously, it's very important to my client, and I appreciate, to start with, the report. I think this council should be extremely happy by the results of what your outside forensic consultant came back with. Discussion was very strong several months ago. This stretches back to August, if you remember. That's when the first time the city came in and not only looked at the building, but effectively began to shut down parts of the building for use by the lessee. We're now almost 10 months later. Um, but at the time, there was discussion of millions of dollars of damage, and this is a multi-million dollar asset if you go back to the amount that the Florida Communities Trust has invested in this. And to hear that it could be for $50,000 repaired, there may be more, but quite frankly, that is an amazing report. And I'm very happy on behalf of my client, very happy to hear that the motion's been made to support that. Um, but I also want to follow up on two other things, one of which the nice lady just spoke about. Um, yes, it has been a significant impairment to Ms. Andrews' business. Since November of last year through last Sunday, she's authorized me to let you know and let the public know that there's been a, about $90,000 of lost revenue year to year. And I don't know many local businesses that could survive such a hit, particularly still in a pandemic, particularly still with all of the things going on with supply chain issues, shortage of workers, inflation, and everything else. I'm not here to discuss that, but I do respectfully request that we continue to have negotiation through council on that issue because that's an important aspect. Now, I know that's not part of the lease, but I do want to make you aware that I will be speaking with council about that. It's not a threat, and I don't want it to be perceived as a threat. I want you to be aware that this is an important aspect. Finally, one of the most important things is that because that building is part of the Florida Communities Trust, there are very important requirements that come along with having received that money as part of the Florida uh, Working Waterways. And I previously spoke with Mr. Anand. The lease for this building has a requirement that the Florida Communities Trust Declaration of Reservations always supersedes any lease that you have. And so, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you would indulge me, I want to put one small section of that lease up. Oh, I will allow that. Thank you. Make sure I put it in the box. This is from page six. Right, so you have just a couple minutes left, so. I understand, and I'll be very quick. Um, when you see this, it talks about that alterations, if made, have to receive the approval of the Florida Communities Trust. But the most important part is what I want to identify right here. The approvals acquired will not be unreasonably withheld for demonstration that proposed structures, buildings, improvements, signs, vegetation removal, or land alterations will not adversely impact the natural resources or working waterfront aspects of the project site. Now, I know that there's going to be continuing discussion about what's going to happen with this building, but I want to make you aware 
that that's going to require the input and authorization of the Florida Communities Trust. And to the extent that this building was going to be demolished or torn down or significantly altered, um, that's something that this community should be aware of because, as you said, Mayor Hill, this is a community asset. So, in closing, with the recent loss of the Archie Smith uh, Fish House as part of the working waterfront, Krabby Bills is vital to maintaining this key aspect to the history and heritage of the city of Sebastian. Please proceed with the repairs as quickly as possible and with specific focus on removing the interior wall that is limiting access and getting the eatery open as soon as possible. This certainly reflects the report from the engineer and the will based on the motion of council. And thank you for your time, cooperation, and professionalism. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Ten seconds. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'll, ma I'll get you to you next, okay? I'll go to you next, okay? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Rick Lopez. I'm actually from Miami, but my family's been coming here for over 20 years. Um, I love this community. My kids love this community. Um, my aunt and uncle have relocated, so we come here more often. Um, it caught my attention when we saw the, the Archie Smith Fish House uh, partially collapse into the water. Um, because I'm, I'm an architect and I work with uh, historic preservation, um, I'm actually on the Historic Preservation Board for the city of Miami Beach, and we're constantly dealing with preserving the city's heritage while allowing for new development um, to um, complement it. I first came here over 20 years ago as a, um, uh, you know, working with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, so I've been seeing how the community's been evolving over the last 20 years, and uh, I remember going to Judah's Fish House um, and, and learning about the history of the place. And, and now I see that, you know, there's only a couple of these wood frame structures on, on the waterfront remaining. And while um, the Archie Smith Fish House is, is a protected, it's in, a, you know, Indian River County Conservation Area. It's registered with the, uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the, the, the current structure that we're talking about here tonight is, is not protected. And, um, I'm really happy to see that the city's being active about, proactive about um, um, taking care of the structure and, and hopefully uh, taking care of the, the tenants too for the community. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to speak to the cultural value of, of these historic buildings. Um, it's, a, it's a shame to let these fall into decay um, because once they're gone, they're, they're just gone they, and they don't come back. Um, and so I think that while there is value to the physical structure there and the, the report that we just heard about you know, analyzes the, the conditions of the physical structure, um, I think the community should also be aware of the in, intangible value that it has to the identity of the place. Um, oftentimes we see developers come to Miami Beach because of, its, his, because of the historic buildings. I mean, not just the, the music and the noise and the beach, but um, it's the oldest historic district in the country. And it's not because of any one particular building, but because of the collection of buildings that give the, the place um, a kind of a, an anchor um, to, the, to the community. And um, I wanted to, I drove up here today with my dad. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of, of building a house here in the, in the community. And, you know, I hope to continue coming here for a long time, but it would be, um, that much more meaningful to come to a place that takes care of, of the little bit of history it has left. So I wanted to share that, and I, I appreciate the work you all are doing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak on this? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Good evening. Um, my name is Beverly Hibson. Oh. <laughs> I'm so nervous. My name is Beverly Hipkins, and I'm from Vero Beach. But I love Sebastian, and I love Krabby Bills, and I love the people there in it because they love what they do. They are native Floridians. I got so excited when I first came that Heather, the um, manager there, invited me to a baby shower that she was having there. I got so excited, I came a week early with two presents, one for the baby and one for her sister. They just love what they do. 
And all their customers love them too. I assure you, if you just sat there for an hour, you would see that very readily. And when you said, the mayor said just now, that you are not planning to close them down, I'm going to hold you to it. And I also hope that you would take in consideration for the other times that you were working on the building or you were doing whatever, that they were, they were at a loss, too, for revenue or whatever money, and that you would consider you know, the fees that they're being charged to lower them and just make it easier for them while all this renovation is happening. It's a wonderful place, and so is Sebastian. And we started off with the flag, the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you look into those words, I hope you apply them very seriously to Krabby Bills. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else like to speak on this issue? Yes, ma'am. Grace Reed, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, I just had just one thing. Um, the other night I was watching, I, I haven't been to Krabby Bill, so I've not eaten there. I've not been in the building or anything like that. But I commend to you for what you said, Mayor Hill, about it's not about getting them out of the building, it's about fixing the building for safety. And the other night when I watched Channel 5 and saw the interview, <clears throat> I was surprised to hear them say that the city came and closed the back dining room with no notice, just came and closed it. And I thought that was odd. You know, I didn't think that the city would do anything like that. So I'm not privy to those actions or anything like that. I don't know what the truth is in that or anything. But my question would be, if a customer sitting on that back dining room deck, how much prior notice were they going to get if something fell out of the roof, off the wall, or for God forbid, the floor fell out? So it is all about making the building safe, and you should be commended for that. It shouldn't be about whether or not we're trying to evict Krabby Bills as the tenant or anything like that. It's trying to make that building safe in the best possible way. And a little bit of inconvenience to make that safe would be my priority. Um, then also in that engineer's report, the immediate stuff that you all voted on tonight, are getting ready to vote on tonight, is, is commendable. But then there was a section about things that can be done in the future. Um, and if that's not possible to do those things, I mean, is, it, is there even a consideration if that side of the building has to be torn down and demolished eventually? Is there a way to put a boardwalk across there where you can still have maybe some benches and people can still, e either on their daily walks or somebody visiting the city, they can actually sit and still watch the fishermen and see the river? So if the back of the building can't be saved, by looking at the pictures, I don't want to walk out there. So <laughs> that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate that. I can assure you there will be many, many discussions going forward. Does anyone else wish to speak on this this evening? Okay. Seeing none, I'll close public input. Uh, Council, I just took a few notes. Um, from the, from the people speaking, and, and one of the things that I am a customer of Krabby Bill, so I, I go there and I get fish, um, and I enjoy it. It's very fresh. It's a wonderful place to go. It's in a wonderful place. It's right on the riverfront. Um, there were some things said. Uh, the The fish market is not the working waterfront. It's it's a part of the facility that we have down there, so we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about going forward. Um, and then there was another statement made about taking care of the history and heritage in our community, and the entirety of Fisherman's Landing is based upon taking care of our history and heritage. That's why we went forward with that project back in 2008. I remember sitting up here and, and being on the right end of a 3-2 vote, fighting to make sure that we could get that building purchased by the city and restored to be where we are today. And I'm very proud of that. And that's a very, very positive thing for the city of Sebastian. It has helped to revitalize the entire riverfront, in my opinion. The businesses were, people were going out of business back then along our riverfront. This building was completely overgrown by vegetation. 
Many, many uh, of the businesses were struggling, to say the least, and now we have a thriving, beautiful riverfront district, and this project is right dead in the middle of it. And this council, over the years, changed, changed faces, but it's never changed its commitment to Fisherman's Landing and that project and the history and heritage of our community. So I believe that this is just another step going forward in that. Uh, any other comments from council? Yeah. Mr. Thank you, Mr. 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 Nunn, go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. Um, you know, uh, I myself eat there. I, it's probably once a week. Uh, Cook makes great food there, so uh, love eating there. Um, my wife's favorite uh, lobster bisque. So I read something, and I hope there's no one out there in the audience that really believes anybody that works for this city or sits up on this council believes that we are people that have nothing better to do than ruin other people's lives and have trouble sleeping at night. I can tell you clearly that every decision I've ever made sitting up on this council, I can sleep at night because I know it's the right decision, it's the right thing for our city, it's the right thing for the people. I consider myself an honorable person, and I think every one of these, these guys sitting up here are honorable, including our city manager. None of us have ever wanted to do anything mean. None of us ever wanted to put anybody out of business. That was never our goal. That was never my goal. That was never, Anything I pushed forward was was working with the city manager. What can we do to help keep this 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 place going? What can we do? Uh, I've heard uh, when it was Mayor Dodd. I've heard him tell people, "Hey, I had the best fish sandwich I ever had today at Crappy Bills." This was before any of this started. Uh, I think all of us have have been there, eaten there. We love the place, but nothing we're doing is about the tenant, and that's not to mean to belittle that fact, it's about making a building safe that it's owned by the city and has issues and that we have responsibilities to take care of to make sure it's safe for ourselves. Because if we get sued because somebody gets hurt, it doesn't hurt me, it hurts the city. It doesn't hurt the council, it hurts the city and all, and the taxpayers. So uh, we, we love our tenant. Our tenant does an amazing job with what they do there. Um, but everything we're doing is about keeping a building safe for the citizens. Thank you. Mr. Dodd. Uh, yeah, I, um, thanks for that because the social media has been, has been ridiculous <laughs> as it usually is. Um, that's why I don't, don't read it, but <clears throat> I, I think we have to look at this from a different perspective. We have to separate this issue. This isn't about crabby bills. It really isn't as much as people want to make it about crabby bills. And, and this is about the fact that uh, we have a building that we have to deal with. That's, that's basically what the council has to do, is they have to deal with that. And I think we have two overall objectives that we need to try to accomplish as we, as we move through that. And I'm going to talk about those in a second, but um, these things relate back to the Stan Mayfield Working Waterfront Grant that we received to build the working waterfront. And, and the Hurricane Harbor building was not initially part of that, and the conversations that the mayor was talking about about purchasing that building took place after that, and it, it was very wise that the three people who voted in favor of buying the building did so, and it didn't go the other way, because um, it's become part of that overall working waterfront process, that building. That is the historical component of that, even though the building's not on any register, it's no place like that. And that that, money, that project was funded by a state grant, and the objective of that state grant was to immortalize, immortalize, immortalize if I can say that correctly eventually, uh, the fishing industry in the Indian River. And I, I went back and found an editorial that was written uh, by Mason Bowman, uh, Bowen, um, and I'll, I'll use his name because he wrote it and I don't want to plagiarize him, but he wrote a very nice editorial about the working waterfront. I'm sorry. Nope. Am I doing something? No, you're perfect. Okay. A very, a very nice editorial about the working waterfront and went back and talked about the history. And that basically the working waterfront needs to have multiple components. Not only the fishing industry, that is the boats coming in and unloading fish, but also the retail industry uh, is very important. And even though a restaurant inside of the Hurricane Harbor building was not initially part of the working waterfront, and we went through some growing pains and some lawsuits over the initial restaurant that was put in there. It's very important, that, that whole process, that, uh, the, the retail fish market is very important to that. So our two objectives, I believe, 
is to preserve the integrity of the Hurricane Harbor building. That has to be separate. It's not part of the working waterfront. It's, it's that building. We have to protect the integrity of that as it has become an integral part of the working waterfront that we purchased through the Stan Mayfield Working Waterfront Grant. We also have to secure, if we, by, by taking the appropriate steps, the long-term future of probably what's one of the best fish retail markets on the east coast of Florida. Okay. Uh, now, I'm sure there's people in other parts of the state that will argue with me as whether Krabby Bills is the best retail fish market, probably but the it's one of, the, one of the best. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and those things are part and parcel of what the, the council has been trying to do, and it's important that we do those. We're not trying to close down Krabby Bills. It has to be separated from our problem. It's an, they're a tenant that has a very good fish house, very good retail market, produces very good food. As my brother tells me, they have the best chef in Central Floor in, Cent in the Treasure Coast working in there. So, uh, and, uh, but it's not part of the problem that we're looking at. It, it should be part of the solution that we're looking at, but not part of the problem that we're looking at. I am of the opinion, however, that this short-term patch that we're talking about tonight is going to be the demise of that restaurant. I'm of that opinion. And I'm of that opinion for primary, basically for one reason, and I'm quoting our city engineer who did a great job in, in putting this stuff together. And this is a quote. The building is in the need of significant long-term decision of the final determination on how the city should move forward due to the significant repairs that are required. As noted in previous reports and meetings, the short-term repairs that are listed in this current report that we received and we're asking to approve tonight are just the beginning of that. They're not the final solution of that building. They may get us through 12 or 18 months, but I don't think that as a result of us taking this, this approach to it, that we're doing anything that's going to prolong the life of the leasee of that building and operator of that restaurant by more than the 12 to 18 months. I think it's, I think we're basically we're, we're we're saying that we don't we don't really care about that. I, I believe that personally. I also don't think the $50,000 mark is reasonable, and I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, saying anything bad about our engineer that doing this. I think when you get in there and finish this, you're talking more about a couple hundred thousand dollars. The minute you take that laminate off the floor and you realize what the subfloor looks like, you're now going to be looking at $50,000 to replace the subfloor, if you can replace it without getting underneath the building and replacing the, the, the piers underneath the building to support the subfloor. So let's just understand that if we approve this tonight, we're really approving about $200,000, but we'll get that through multiple change orders. Each one of those may be well within the minor, less than $15,000 approval limit that doesn't come back to council. Okay, each one of them may well be within that. So I think these patches are, are going to mean that Krabby Bill's, as a restaurant, will go away. Our problem that we're trying to solve is the building. So why don't we solve that problem? Why are we continuing to do these studies after studies after studies and taking short-term patch after short-term patch after short-term patch? I think we have a better plan that we should go forward with. First of all, I think the city should address the long-term fix of the building. They should continue to support Krabby Bills and let them operate as they currently operate. And if it's possible to assist them in having more in dining room space by making a couple of things done to the building, do that. I'm not saying that we don't, that we go in and fix all this stuff, but if it's possible to do that, let them operate as they're currently operating while we go through the process of putting together a design, an engineering design and, and a public design. That, that's going to take us 12 months to do that. Let them continue to operate. I perfectly would be perfectly happy to give them rate breaks, to give them you know lease uh, payment breaks, do whatever needs to be due to assist them to stay in business in there. As part of determining the long-term fix to the building, whatever that is, if it's tearing it down and rebuilding it, which we can do, there are many architects, maybe there's one sitting in our audience tonight, that do historical building restoration and could, could produce a new building that looks exactly like that building. Since it's non-historical, that would not be in anybody's best bad interest to do that. There's many people that can do that. And when, the, when we end up getting into the construction phase, what we would have to do is work out a, an agreement between Krabby Bills, our, our tenant, I don't care if it's the tenant is called Macintosh Hamburgers, but we work out an agreement with our tenant that will allow them to stay in business 
while we do the, our, the final construction and restoration on the building. There's many ways to do that. We can put a, uh, we can, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen trailers that are set up on the inside like a delicatessen. There's many ways to do that. It requires, however, to do that, a cooperative environment between all the parties involved. The leaseor, the leasee, and the city. And leasee is the city, but the problem is that it has to also involve the city staff from the perspective of not being a, not being a landlord to do that. Um, so I would rather spend the money doing the fix on the building and try to, and try to and do everything possible to keep them in business. The one thing that concerns me about this, this approach, though, and the one thing that I think really jeopardizes its success is that I just haven't personally seen in any of the conversations I've been in in the last 10 months or 12 months on this project, I haven't seen any cooperation coming from some of the parties involved in this. Um, there, I, I, as I understand it, there's been options provided, and they've been all turned down. Uh, I haven't talked to the owner of Krabby Bills because they hired an attorney, and once an attorney was hired, I can't talk to the owner of Krabby Bills. We're now in a different med. We're now in a so totally different environment when that happens. So I think that we're making a mistake to approve this. I will vote against this motion for that purpose because I think we're making a mistake to take this approach. Thank you. That, thank you. And that's fair, but I would, I would only suggest to you that, that by not, that this is not the end. And as, I, as was discussed earlier, um, this is simply to make this building safe and viable going into the next 18 to 24 months, where in the report, as it states, there are much greater things that need to be done. So the, the fact, we, we couldn't just sit here and say, we're just going to leave it the same, and then we're going to do a full restoration of this building, because we're not certain that's what, needs, that's what we can even do. So I think that that's a, that's a separate issue in, in, unto its own. I think if we pass this this evening, we can go forward and get this building shored up, open up the back deck area, get, their, get them working again in, the, in a safe manner, and then continue the discussion on a council level uh, as to what we're going to do with the future of that building. That's simply my thoughts. Yeah. Mr. Johnson. And um, I agree that uh, this is a Band-Aid, but mm -hmm. it's a risk that I'm willing to take uh, with my vote to keep that business there because I'm all about small businesses. I believe that to maintain our riverfront the way it is, we need businesses like that. But what I am not willing to risk is the safety of the owner, her employees, or anybody else to go in that building. So if we can make a portion of that safe enough where they can operate better, and, and right now I'm all for that. So, and you know, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse what some of my uh, counterparts have said because I don't talk very much, if some of you have made, noticed. I'm just short and quick, so that's it for me. Thank you, sir. Mr. McFarland? Well, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll be the problem child then, I guess. Probably Susie looks back and wishes she never called me, whatever, uh, about a year ago. You know, and I, and I wasn't present for some of the conversations between the parties. And there's always three stories. There's their story, your story, and what really happened. So I wasn't there, and I heard there was no communication between the city and between the renter, you know, and they were trying. On both sides, I heard it, it's the other one, it's the other one. I wasn't there, so I don't know what that was. I agree with you, Mr. Dodd. I would like, I would hope that the city points out the 50,000, which of these needs that are listed in here that's supposed to cover, because I really don't think when it had the future taking care of the roof, I know that's not covered under the 50,000. So I'd like to know specifically what are the 50,000 because, you know, once you do start opening it, there's going to be more stuff. I'm hoping that this opens up the communication between the city and between the tenant, because hopefully, and again, I'd like a little clarification. Now, is the first 10 years up December 2013, or is it when it was amended March 19, 2024, will the first 10 years end, and then it's the March date? Okay, is looking at that because it seems sometimes, like you said, we're just kicking to get to that date, 2024, she's out, then we'll figure out. I hope there's conversation, what are we going to do, and in the interim, if she's looking forward and we're agreeable for her the additional 10 years, because in the original lease, if you go back, you know, you got to look at this lease. I've looked at it. Actually, I signed this lease. So... You know, the building was taken as is. What does that mean? That means you took it as is, no backseats, that's it, right? 
you know, but there are, there are things on both sides, what to do. I mean, there was also the opportunity for improvements. Maybe we can look on this original lease, working with the tenant as far as improvements and shared cost of the improvements. And maybe that could lead into whatever, you know, because there is the potential after March 2024, an additional 10 years, maybe something a little bit longer. But that's what I'd like to see, is the communication doesn't stop. I wish Mr. Sweeney didn't have to come up here to, to integrate, you know? I mean, it was great when I sat down with Susie one-on-one, -on -one. you know, but we need staff to sit down with Susie and hash this out. But, you know, and, and I've heard that it's the other or it's the other. I don't know whose it is, but maybe one of us will need to sit in there and see whose it is, who's being reasonable, who's being unreasonable going forward. But if you could just verify on this 50,000 we're voting for tonight, which of these, because you have immediate repairs, you have miscellaneous repairs, you have the future repairs, which are the ones that are, you know, and at the end it says $50,000 will do the starting. So what are we expecting for the 50,000 to be done? So the items that are going to be addressed are the immediate repairs. Those are the safety repairs, which is the undermined concrete by the rear bar, the buckle, buckling floor area and substructure to be replaced, the termite damage, the beams, uh, the beams in the uh, over around the bar area and the dining and the dining room area, and then there's some outside stuff to safe up some of those uh, outbuildings that stick out of the building that are going to be removed, and some of them are just going to be closed off. So that's what's going to be. Uh, done along with the exterior trench to try to prevent the termites and stuff from getting in there. Uh, but, and then the weatherproofing, those miscellaneous and the immediate repairs are what we're really talking about trying to get done with the 50,000. Okay. So the future repairs with the roof replacement and then the canopy stuff is not included for that 50,000. No, because our concern is as we start into that, we exceed the 51% value of the building, and now we have to bring the entire building right. up to code. That's right. the big issue that's still hanging out there. Okay. Well, again, like I said, is that, you know, I'm for doing this portion, but continuing the communication, because there is the opportunity at the end of March 2024 to go forward with an additional 10 years, and something could be negotiated, because I guess the city could just say, nope, and then we'll decide what we're going to do with the building. I mean, they've done some, I guess, wonderful things recently down in Vero Beach with that concession here, place they have in J.C. Park, you know, and, and when that got opened up for bids. But that's something to discuss, but I guess we'll... Hold the vote, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, and and I agree, Mr. McPartland, that you know the communication has to continue because this isn't a fix for the building. This is something to con to to help the building uh, continue to operate uh, in its in, in its current capacity, but more safe. Uh, so, uh, I think those those discussions need to take place from now on until the de decision is made as to exactly what is going to happen in that facility. So, anything else? Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember McPartland? Yes. Councilmember Nunn? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Jones? Yes. And Councilmember Dodd? No. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, if I may? Yes. Can, uh, the IT needs to take a five minute recess. They have to address a problem with the podium mic. Okay. But that's yep. All right. Way. We're going to take a quick recess. We'll be back at 7.05.
I will call this meeting back to order and get on to something much less controversial. Item 12A, first reading of ordinance number 0-22-07, a petition for voluntary annexation of the Grave Brothers property. Okay, Mr. Anand. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is an ordinance of the city of Sebastian, Florida, providing for the voluntary annexation for land consisting of 1,984.22 acres, more or less, located south of County Road 510 right of way, west of land adjacent to the 74th Avenue right of way, north of 69th Street right of way, and east of 90th Avenue right of way, providing for the extension of the corporate limits and boundaries thereof, providing for an interim land use and zoning classification, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflict and severability, and providing for an effective date. All right, thank you. Mr. Crown? Yeah, Mayor, Member of Council, this is uh, basically the first reading to determine if Council <clears throat> desire, uh, has a desire to move forward with annexing this land, uh, the 1,984.22 acres, more or less. Um, of the Graves property into the city of Sebastian. Noted there will be several meetings that precede this after this meeting if you choose to go forward and it will, based on how the council decides, it would basically uh, end in about September sometime in the end of September to for final readings. But today, we're, before, what's before us today is the ordinance to determine if annexing land and the destiny of and the future uses within the city are, are it's palatable for us to, to bring that land into the city. And Ms. Frazier's here to answer any questions regarding the application. The applicant is here to answer questions that you may have of them. And with that, I will leave it to the council to deliberate and ask us any questions or questions of the applicant. Okay, with that said, I'll uh, move approval of ordinance number 0-2207, a petition for voluntary annexation of the Grave Brothers Company and set a public hearing for September 14, 2022. Second that. All right, thank you. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on this issue? Um, and I'll remind everyone uh, once again that, that we appreciate all comments that come and we will not have any cheering or jeering. Uh, we want everyone to be very comfortable when they come up and speak. You'll have five minutes to speak. Council, I'll ask that if you have any questions uh, that come up, up to you while someone's speaking that you go ahead and write them down and after everyone speaks that we'll go ahead and get with staff on some of those issues, okay? Anyone wish to speak tonight? Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Tim Glover, President of Friends of St. Sebastian River in Rosen, Florida here. <clears throat> and we're under no illusion that this property would be uh, conserved and protected unless there is the will and funding to do so. There are parts of the property that we're obviously concerned about and interested in uh, that are worth protecting. Um, a wilderness has a value um, as opined by uh, Wallace Stegner in his 1960 wilderness letter. Uh, he said it, wilderness is worth saving, if nothing else, if you just drive to the edge of it and look in. There's also a duty of care. Um, I think we all have the expectation that we wouldn't be poisoned by our drinking water or harmed by air, polluted air and other environmental considerations, um, such as the poor gentleman who um, dared to step into the Tampa Bay a few weeks ago and died three days later of the bacterial infection. Granted, that's Tampa Bay, but my understanding is, is that Tampa Bay was uh, in conditions similar to the Indian River Lagoon, and supposedly has been restored, obviously not completely restored. But uh, these are issues that I hope you would take into consideration, not only in this matter, but all matters before the city. And if you move forward with this, uh, when it gets to the planning phase, we certainly look forward to offering uh, more comments on the details then. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I'm Diana Bolton. I'm a long, uh, local girl. I grew up here, went to elementary school here, graduated from Vero Beach High School. I went away and got educated and came back here to be in a peaceful town. And I am not against development. I'm in 
some of you may not know this, but I am a retired mortgage banker. I was a mortgage banker for 23 years, ran a successful firm, and my partners were developers. I bought and sold and built a lot of property. My grandparents here built a lot of houses that are still standing from 60 years ago. They're buried in the Sebastian Cemetery. My mother is Shirley Craigle. She ran the uh, Sebastian, owned the Sebastian Sun newspaper, was a reporter for the Orlando Sentinel and the uh, Today newspaper, and she owned the Sebastian Sun. She's married to Wayne Craigle. Wayne Craigle is the grandson of the founder of Pelican Island. He's my stepfather. So I have a long culture here. I grew up here clamming, hanging out in the orange groves. And I love this town. When I came here, there were a 1,000 people. I love this town. We have a town full of mostly people, whether they grew up here like I did or whether they just moved here yesterday or whether they're thinking about moving here or relocating here. They're looking for peace and tranquility and wildlife and nature and a healthy life. So um, we're, we're back to ground zero here. Two years ago, we were in the same position, only now it's, it's a double down request, which was predicted because the other land was being assimilated. That land's going to be developed. The, the question is, will it be developed responsibly? That's the big question. And to give a blank check where it's agriculture land, why in the world would you want to zone, would you want to annex 1,000, what is it, 8,000? No, 1,984 acres, 1984 acres of ag land without any kind of plan. It's like giving a blank check. What's in it for you? What's in it for us? So really, the question is, and the question a lot of us have is, how many units are going to be put on that property? We know the reason for bringing it forward here is the county wants to do only one residence per five acres. Whereas they're going to be asking for up to 10, 10 units per acre. It's going to be a much higher density. Can we handle that? Is that going to double our population? Is it going to add 30% to our population? Are we, can we handle the impact on our resources? As my grandparents said to me, and they're in the Sebastian Cemetery now, they said, if you can't take care of what you have, you're not going to get any more. So, We've got to take care of what we have, and I'm not seeing that. We've got a lot of problems here. It would take a whole other hour of, of talking, but let's be transparent. Let's call it a, a, an ace and ace and say, you know, the reason this is being annexed is so that they can get a blank check on higher density. We know that. You know it. We know it. Everybody knows it. So it's not going to be ag land for long. Let's, let's put a plan together first. Let's take care of what we have first. Let's stop poisoning and spraying our town. Let's take care of our wildlife and the reasons we came here. And the reason my stepfather's grandfather stood up to a very unpopular public and he made a stand. And his home of Pelican Island now is on all our signs as a marketing tool. Let's do the right thing for our town. We love our town. And a lot of people feel the way I do. So um, I appreciate what you guys are doing in that direction. And I think you're going to have the same opposition you had before, only it's going to be doubled. So let's, let's talk about a plan first. Thank you. Grace Reed, Sebastian. As I imagined it would, as soon as the item hit the agenda, social media be again became a buzz with all kinds of information, whether it be misinformation or accurate information. But many have lost sight of what this segment is about tonight. Tonight it's just, do we move on with annexing the land? Planning, changing of the zoning, all of that other stuff, it would become later. The, the land's going to be developed. It's just who's going to be monitoring the development. And if it's a multi-use zoning, that's up to 10 acres, I mean 10 units per acre, that doesn't mean it's going to be 10 units per acre. I would put my faith in my city council to say, no, we don't want that many per acre. 
Just because it says you can doesn't mean that's what you're going to do. I feel like that's develop the development of this area, whether we annex it or not, is going to be a long way off because there's a whole lot of planning in it. I mean, it, it's going to be some time before anything is even built there. I'm encouraging all the council members to vote for it. There is another subdivision planned that's right on the Sebastian River near Blue Water Bay that has been approved for 100% septic. The city of Sebastian has ordinances that you're not building anything in new subdivisions without public utilities. So all of the environmentalists are talking about save the river, save this and save that. I approve of that wholeheartedly. I love the wildlife just as much as anybody else does. But the only time I ever hear any feedback about the subdivisions and stuff is when it's coming about in the city of Sebastian. It seems like nobody wants the city of Sebastian to, to go any further. Just stay in the confines of what you got. But 510 is going to get developed. There's a big roundabout coming. They're going to four-lane it. And just because it's ag land right now, if somebody, that developer sells it to somebody else, they might not be putting one unit per five acres. They might build retail. You never know when they're going to come in and want to change the zoning. Just because they don't see a request for zoning in it now doesn't mean it won't come. And it could be all kinds of retail. It could be everything. People living in the subdivisions on that I-510, on the 510 corridor, they're going to be coming into Sebastian. They're going to be attending our festivals, using our boat ramps, eating at the restaurants, and frequenting our local businesses. That's great. It's awesome. But that's going to be a strain on the park, the boat ramps, and the waterfront. The county will be providing emergency services, but maintenance of the city facilities becomes the burden of city taxpayers. So wouldn't it be best if we were able to have new residences and businesses contribute to the cost? Growth is coming. You can't stop it. We can only control our destiny. Again, I'm encouraging you all to approve and go forward the, with the annexation. And also, as the former resident said, there's going to be a lot of opposition to it, just like there was the last time. So I'm just hoping that we make sure that the public is completely informed of the progress of the, any development, any coming meetings. Um, knowledge with accurate information, it's a wonderful thing. The more people know, the less they will listen to the folks who are out to promote their own agendas and not in the best interest of the city. Lies and misinformation carry with speed, but the truth and accuracy have endurance. Regardless of the multi-use, again, I would encourage that even though it carries up to 10 units per acre, I would, I would hope that the, the council would approve anything that comes at that large one increase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Sherry Matthews, Sebastian. Um, as we all know that growth is inevitable, no matter what we do and how we sit and what we vote, it's still inevitable. Annexation is one of the primary means of growth in a municipality. What I'm asking is that as we move through, move forward with this annexation process, that there's a few things that we, we kind of remind ourselves and take into consideration. Number one, we need to be very transparent with the processes and what we're doing. The second is to um, what best suits Sebastian. Keep that in mind. Can we do the infrastructure, whatever's coming about with the annexation? I um, personally have absolutely no problem sharing the tax burden with those using our facilities and services. So whenever we are doing anything with annexation or whenever there is growth, absolutely those folks that are using our facilities and our services should share the tax burden with us. Um, I'd just like to, um, just to just remind as we move through this process, it is going to be a, long, a several month process and as we do it, just to remember the transparency and you know that the people are expecting expecting to know what's going on, and there is going to be opposition. I do have a question that, um, on the transmittal, and if I could just get some clarification for my own 
Sorry, I can't see it that close there, that for me. The applicant, this just says, on, um, and it was on page 111, it says the applicant does not have a proposed development plan for the subject property at this time. Additional information regarding the future use of the property will be presented during the zoning amendment and land development process. What is the additional information that is, be, is being referred to in that statement? I will ask the city manager that question. The additional information is the plan when he come up, comes up with the plan. Upcoming plan. So yes. nothing that's in there's because it says that's, there's nothing There's nothing there that's now. being withheld at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Yes, ma'am. And if you'd like to speak, um, you, you can stand up and, you know, when she's almost done, if you want to just come forward and kind of form a little bit of a line, that would be just fine. It'll save us all some time. Ms. Cottenberg. Thank you, Louise Cottenberg, City of Sebastian. Um, I just want to make sure that the folks out there don't misunderstand the process. Um, Ms. Bolton was kind of getting the horse before the cart. The most important reason for the city to care about bringing an annexation in, I'm not talking about the owner of the property who's seeking annexation, but the city should be looking at it with a serious eye because very basic one sentence, you have no control over anything that is not within your boundaries. So to talk about what can be done and what should be done and what would be favorable to the city is absolutely ridiculous if the property isn't within our boundaries because we don't have that control if it's not in our boundaries. And nothing can be planned on a property that would suit the city until the property's within the city. It's like you can't you can't drive a carriage with a horse in the back. Horse in front, carriage in back. Horse pulls the carriage. So um, I, I, the reason for a city to consider an annexation is has nothing to do with what might be in somebody else's mind. It has to do with we have no control if it's not within our boundaries. And um, if it's not within our boundaries, it'll be within somebody else's boundaries. And then again, I don't have my little bell here to ring, but ding, ding, ding. This is important. Pay attention. <laughs> You're going to get cooked. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi, I'm Patricia Marion. I live at 719 Yearling Trail in um, Sebastian. I actually have a question. I would like to know if, because I'm, I'm, I'm confused, are you just voting on the uh, annexation now, or is there a land use amendment that goes along with the annexation? This is, an an this is the annexation. So there is no... It'll, it'll, be, it'll be designated as mixed use in the city. The city does not have agriculture as a, a zoning, so it'll be a, a, it'll be a basic annexation with a mixed use zoning which means that the zoning will be determined at a later date, and that the zoning will have to go through planning and zoning and, and many, many meetings, and there will be a lot of information and meetings so, going forward to determine probably individual parts of this, 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 this property. Because I saw some, uh, I guess I was looking over some of the paperwork involved with this, and there was something designated institutional. Not at this time. There's some old stuff that may be showing something like that, but all of those things, all the requirements in our comprehensive plan will have to go into the property. Once we get into the zoning board, we are not in the zoning portion. We are only determining whether or not the city of Sebastian should be the ones that determine what goes on in the property. So there's no guarantee what, what the owner of that property can do, That's we, even if we annex it. There's no guarantee to him that he can build whatever he can. Ma'am, we're not having a discussion, but yes, that is correct. There will be no underlying zoning well, other I'm than mixed use. Well, I'm asking the question. It's not a I, I understand that. So that's the answer. There's no underlying zoning other than mixed use, which, because the city does not have agricultural land. Any adjustments to the use of the land will have to go through the planning and zoning process, which is going to come up many times on this property, I can assure you. Okay. So mixed use means 
He could do anything, basically. The citizens yeah. will determine. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Alyssa Boisvert from Sebastian. I remember just, what was it, three years ago, how up in arms this city was over the whole issue of annexation. And it was pretty clear by the vote, three members of the city council were up at that point for re-election and they got thrown out. If there would have been four or five, they would have all been thrown out. And it all had to do with the annexation. Why am I bringing this up? Because it wasn't that long ago, and the people have been clear. We don't want the annexation. And yes, we all heard the arguments. And no, I don't have a pretty little bell to ring. Um, I don't come from Hollywood, I don't do the theatrics. However, I will tell you that most of the people here will remember come election time. I will tell you that we don't want to be annexed to that property. We don't want the expenses, we don't want the upkeep, and if the county wants to take on that let them. It's their tax dollars that they're going to be spending. We don't need to be spending more money when we can't even spend the money to fix the, um, the trenches and the flooding problem. Fix that first, then we can talk about it. Concerning the argument about Growth is inevitable. It's not inevitable. Grant and Valcaria decided they were going to keep their small town environment. And they joined up together, and guess what? They're keeping their small town environment. Why can't we do that if that is the will of most of the people? Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm going to ask, your time starts when you stand up. So if you want to get more time, be quicker to come up and or stand in line. Yeah. Sit in the front. Sit in the front. That'd be good. Or just speak loudly. Huh? My name is Graham Cox. I live at 1213 George Street in Sebastian. Let me start by quoting somebody you may remember, President Ronald Reagan. And his quote was, here we go again. We're not content with being rebuffed the first time in 2020. We are about to go on the same merry-go-round in 2022. I'm going to raise three points, and I hope I got time in that five minutes to get them all done. First is the whole issue of communicating this annexation plan with the residents. Second is the annexation as a Ponzi scheme. Let me repeat that, a Ponzi scheme. And thirdly, planning for the donut hole, which is this, this property is part of that donut hole. We'll define a little later. We recognize that some things have changed, but some of the underlying problems exposed in the first application, specifically the way the city council and administration are going about this process. And this has not changed. Let me quote from your favorite uh, T.C. Palm columnist, Larry Reisman, Reisman, on the topic of transparency. If consensus is to annex Graves' land, Sebastian must get everyone on the same page. This was the opinion headline. The city must be open with the annexation to ensure everyone is on the same page and has the same information. When the city did the comprehensive plan, we had, a, I thought, a reasonable basis for discussion. Uh, but the problem with the comprehensive plan was that there was very little citizen participation. And I really think if you're going to do something as ambitious as this, there's got to be much more public involvement and citizen involvement. You've got to go out on a horse and explain this thing. 
that you've heard already from folks who've got misunderstanding about what this is and why. The next issue raised again by Larry Reisman on the topic of financial <coughs> reality of annexations. You've got to ask the question, are annexations an asset or a liability? Uh, the annexation might feel like a great idea for Sebastian, which could expand its tax base probably by 30%, but what's the financial reality of, of a proposal like this? We don't know. Developers would contribute to the initial costs of roads, utilities, or other infrastructure, but who would pay decades from now when those roads must be repaved and pipes replaced? According to a folks quoted by Reisman, annexation is the way the municipal corporation preys on its residents. We really have to get out of this as a Ponzi scheme, he told Reisman. Noting cities get a financial sugar higher, high from the annexed land taxes, but must face reality when true operating costs come due. A colleague uh, of uh, the fellow who talked to Reisman says, uh, annexations are dangerous. It's like fighting obesity by, bu obesity, obesity by buying bigger clothes. My third point, and final point, there are some serious discussions going on at the county level with affected landowners and with the interested government watchdog groups in the county. And the county is being aided by consultants Kinley Horn to think through the best solution for ag zone land in the county, especially the 30 square mile donut hole north of Route 60, south of the Sebastian border and south of uh, County Route 210 and west of the Corrigan Ranch on I-95. I would suggest the cities of Sebastian, Felsby, and Vero, plus the affected landowners, and they're not many, coordinate with the county and the MPO come up, to come up with a better, more creative vision for the whole of the donut hole, and then figure out the best cooperative mean, means to make it work over time. Approving the Graves Brothers annexation right now takes a big bite out of this donut hole. You get 20 seconds. A major chunk. And uh, before the county and the community at large have finished their work, that is the county, and all these parties should talk to each other and then entertain something from Graves Brothers. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Peter Hink. I'm a resident of Sebastian, moved here about 10 years ago. I started coming up to Sebastian back in the early 1970s and fell in love with it then. And uh, what really attracted me to this town was it was a small fishing village. And that's why a lot of people that come here is because it has that feel of a small town, a small village. And the annexation, I just feel, would cause it to expand and become where, of like areas that I've left down south where it's just grown and grown and it's just gotten too big. You know, it has a special culture and it has a special feel. And I would love to see Sebastian still maintain a small town feel where everyone comes together and everyone seems to, and I know all my neighbors and we're all friends and I just like to keep that and not get it to see it grow too much like everybody else. You know, I don't feel like growth is always the best thing. I think if we work on what we have and clean it up and make our town better, it would be so much better off in the future. And I think that's why most of the people that came to Sebastian are here for. And that's why I think a lot of them don't like the annexation thing because it's going to turn into like, of course, St. Lucie or other areas. But uh, that's all I'm going to say. Love Sebastian, love the old town feel, love the old town feeling that Sebastian has, and I'd like to see this city remain that way. But thank you. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, good, uh, good evening. I'm Richard Baker, president of the Pelican Island Audubon Society, and uh, we have kind of been involved in this project uh, before. Um, I think that you, we really need to uh, think about working with the county and, and the other cities and how we want to develop this county. We have done a horrible job in our environment. The lagoon is dying. Some have said it's 
dead. The Sebastian River is dying. And this property that you're talking about is at the headwaters of the Sebastian River. And it is dying. I happen to live on the river. I don't have any sod. But I, yesterday I was out and I saw three manatees suffering, hard to breathe. They were coming up and just, uh, and I was worried about it. I've seen dead manatees on the Sebastian River. The fishing is going down. This is a big agricultural area in, in our county. It's very prominent in producing a lot of good agriculture. Beef, citrus is kind of going downhill, but there are other opportunities for this land. People are starving. We need to think about how to feed people. And so I think we need to get an overall look on how we manage our land here and I think we all in the county need to work with the county. The cities need to work with the county. And it's not just one, I want the tax to go here or tax go there. Take Collier Creek. That's in your county, in your city. You go visit the new part of that. There's a whole big development going in there. It's gone in there. You're requiring at least one tree in the property. You go down that new part of it now, you, don't, you see one house with one tree. All the rest of them have taken them out and probably put in a palm tree. So you've got to get your ordinances done and you have to enforce them. When you require a tree, they get approval. When the tree is in there, then they yank it out. The grass, you need to get the turf down so we aren't putting fertilizer, herbicides, and other chemicals on our property. That's all killing our lagoon. And you, you're attached to the lagoon. You're attached to the Sebastian River. So, I mean, all these things are important. And uh, I think we need to look at the big picture first before you start wanting to do, talking about development. Are you gonna have mixed? Or are you gonna have schools? Are you gonna have that? We need to think about our environment. The MPO is going on at the county commission, or at the county level now talking and they're having different workshops in different places. Edu uh, and the environment is not one of the top of the list. And so I think we, you should just wait on this issue until you get the whole thing organized and we plan the, for a, county wise how to do things. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Hi, Donna Halloran, Sebastian. Um, I was up here three years ago doing this, and, um, and certainly I'm really disappointed that it came up again. I knew it would. Um, several of the same issues are what we've been talking about. Uh, conservation, 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 dying, dying, dying. And now they're coming in with twice as much land. Really doesn't make any sense. Um, the county has been working on a plan, the Metropolitan, the MPO plan, and I don't know why we aren't working there. And to think that we wouldn't have, if we don't annex that we have no say, that's bull crap because we still are members of Indian River County and we can vote there as well. So it doesn't need to be done by Sebastian. I do think it's gonna be a, a real um, burden for us. Um, I do like the small feel myself, but I also, realize that um, development is something that is going to take place, but I don't feel that it's our responsibility at this time to take that on. I don't think that we can afford to do it. And I feel like it's a real slap in the face to come in right now and then say, we're, oh, we're going to annex twice as much land than we did the last time when there was such outrage about doing it the last time. I don't think feelings change that much. and. You can say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about um, multi-use. There was so much non-transparency the last time. I don't know why I would trust you again. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you're going to talk, please get up. I'm going to end it. Jim. Yes. Okay, listen, if, you're, if you want to talk, get up and be prepared to speak, please, because... I will be uh, ending discussion as soon as everyone's done talking. Yes, sir. My name is Bill Flynn. I live on Main Street. 
Uh, I had the opportunity last weekend to go back to my hometown that I lived in 40 years ago. And the city made a mistake by not annexing the property directly north of where I was raised. And so the city of Columbus grew around that. And the difference just in one block was incredible. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good chance for the city to get control of the property. Uh, we have children and grandchildren that would like to buy houses. We know that we have a how to, house, housing shortage in the county. And I'd like to, my children to live in the town that I call home. And I trust from the last time that all this was going on, I went to a couple of meetings and there wasn't two or three visitors outside of the, the people that were running the meetings there. They waited to the exact last minute. If they're not involved in the initial meetings, if they're not there to help direct what they want, then they, then they really have no place to complain. I don't always agree with the, with the gentleman up there, although up here I respect every single one of them, and I respect them enough to disagree when I think they're wrong, and I also respect them enough to pat them on the back when I think they're doing a good job. I do have one question. Uh, is the city going to have the same kind of legal agreement to protect them against lawsuits like on the last annexation? I did not see that. We'll go ahead and I'll get to okay. the end. Get it, get it to the end. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for getting up, sir. You may go. You're welcome. My name's Trey McGinn. I'm from Sebastian. Um, I'll go back to 2019, and somebody once said it's deja vu all over again. Um, there was a lot of misinformation. Uh, yes, some people are against annexation, but tonight people presented that it was the majority. I think the majority worked with a lot of people in this room to work very diligently for a recall to undo some of that um, situation. Uh, granted, the, the city council may not have been as transparent as they should have. There was some whoopses there. But I think you're going to do it right this time. Um, I have one question, uh, and that is, why, do we, why will it take all the way to September to have a public hearing? Uh, maybe we need three public hearings. Uh, this is, this is a sensitive subject. Um, I, I worked hard on the recall. I saw how many people were angry, how many people worked very, very hard to undo the situation that occurred because of what happened in the last election. And it almost destroyed the city. It was, it, we were the joke of the whole country there for about six months and I went to every single meeting uh, on the subject of annexation, so I don't get too far sideways, I listened to what everybody said. The fact is, if you don't annex it, you won't control it. Now, I have a lot of opinions about North County and South County, and I have opinions about what the county commission is and how they look at Felsmere and Sebastian. And I've been attending the taxpayers' uh, meetings, and. Most of you know I'm like deeply involved in mosquitoes. Uh, the fact is that we can't always count on the county. And I brag, I brag on the city of Sebastian and this council for how well this city is being run. And if we run an annex as well as we run the rest of the city, we'll be way better off than leaving it to the county. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Nicholas Shuskowski from Sebastian, and I'd just like to say I would feel more comfortable with the City Council and the City of Sebastian running this property than having the county. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? All right. All right. I'm going to close public comment at this time. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone that came up here. A lot of good points. And we had somebody. A lot of things. We have a hand raised on Zoom. Oh, oh wonderful. Sir. I beg your pardon. I will open it up for the Zoom only. Go ahead. Mr. So Staterman, you're unmuted. Technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? When it works. 
Yes, it's very, very good. But thank you uh, for taking this issue up. Uh, my name is Charles Stadelman. I am a resident of Sebastian. I was just um, coming in today to, and congratulating everybody for their efforts on this annexation. Um, but I'd like to rem just to remind the city council of our mission statement is to improve the quality of life in Sebastian by nurturing the beneficial relationship between citizens and our environment by protecting, preserving, and promoting all of our natural resources. And in pursuit of this mission, the Natural Resource Board will provide analysis and advice to the City Council on environmental issues with a three-pronged focus on preservation and enhancement, regulatory programs, and public assets management. I'd like to think that the boards that you have at your disposal are um, tools that you can use to, um, one, answer questions from the general public at large, like we're seeing right now, as well as to condition the people who want us to annex their land, the developers or the people who own the land, again, to bring them into the fold and to maybe um, show them what we're doing as far as things we want for in the future and sustainable development and as such. But also in the, pre the preservation and enhancement guidelines, um, we would like to, um, in, in section number B, development of initiatives and programs for conservation of sensitive lands and open space to be pursued both within the city proper and regionally on an intergovernmental basis as well as under regulatory programs guidance, proposals for development of additional areas of environmental protection regulations, as well as formulation of policies considerations to be used as guidelines by the Planning Zoning Commission in considering land development regulations, as well as other things. But I'd just like to remind the council that at the very end, the city council may assign a request additional activities by any of its boards. So you could use your boards mm -hmm. to go through these proposals before they actually become um, issues of moving policy. We could have addressed a lot of these questions that are being asked right now. We can also bring up these much new initiatives that we've been pushing recently of sustainability as well as uh, we can set precedents on building resilience to these institutions in a sustainable development manner. One of the things that has to happen is it has to start at the top. You have to say, okay, we would like to take these and have your input. We don't want um, to be dragging it through the mud or having it beat down or anything. We want it to be a sustainable part of what's going on in the future. And to build resilience to these institutions means that when you leave your position, the people behind you have precedent to do the same thing. So the next people that come after you may take the next annexation, seeing the uh, resistance and, and really what's in the um, ordinances anyhow, that they'll use their boards, first of all, as tools to answer these very delicate and very difficult questions. Because most of the people that we've talked to want to keep this area the way it is and the environment the way it is. I travel around a lot and I see there are, there are ways of doing it. The old school ways of developing every square inch of land just isn't sustainable. But in the same breath, those people own that every square inch of land and it needs to be monetized. There are other ways of monetizing land or areas of places with um, new uh, decentralized finance programs, um, different ways of ownership in general. Um, but there's so many new things that really could be brought forth before we get to this point. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right, Council. Um there were a couple questions that were asked, and I'll go ahead and get out of the way, ask the staff real quick. Oh, there's a question on why did we wait till September, um, was it 14th? So, Mayor, yes. September 14th. So there are yes. several meetings that take place, land, uh, the planning and zoning meetings, public comment periods, other uh, municipal and county governments have time to comment on it. 
DEO has to review it. They have two uh, reviews of it that both of those take 30 days and around 60 days total for them. So there's a lot of steps that go through this process. And I know this isn't, as, isn't about zoning, but the, 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 the multi uh, zoning is only the future land use. As these parcels come in to be developed, there's no one believes that 1,900 acres is gonna be developed in one big swath. It would be developed in parcels under either PUDs, and so there'll be plenty of time to talk about each development segment as it comes into the city. Okay, thank you. And then the other one was, uh, is the, do we have legal protection in the documents? So we, were, we are uh, negotiating the uh, agreement, the annexation agreement and, and uh, with the applicant and trying to vet all that out. So yeah, those provisions that will be in there. Okay, thank you. Um, there were, there were a lot, Council, there were a lot of things that, that were said tonight. Some of them were a little bit onerous, but it's understandable, you know, people are concerned about growth and development in this city. I mean, especially someone that moved here 10 years ago and wants it to stop growing. Or, or three years ago, or five years ago, and everyone wants to put up a wall the second they move here, and, and I understand that. I'd love to see that too. I moved here in 90. There were 6,000 people that lived in, in Sebastian in 1990 when I moved here. I think, that, I think today Sebastian's a better community than, than, than it was back in 1990. Um, now, 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 that being said, I think it's the consensus of everyone that spoke here that this, this land will be developed. Everyone that spoke said it will be developed. And, and most of the people who were saying we shouldn't do the annexation was basically saying, let's trust the county to do that for us. Now there's not, there's, the, the city of Sebastian doesn't make money by doing this. We don't spend money by doing these things. Development is gonna take place. The reason you do the annexation, in my opinion, and I'm only one person that's sitting up here, is so that the city of Sebastian can protect the history, heritage, and quality of life of our community. We can grow in a way that lends itself to Sebastian. A county looks at a broad painting and they, they stroke this picture. We know, the citizens of Sebastian know, what they want Sebastian to be. And they're the ones that are gonna help to guide and control this community. And we have a, long, we have a lot of meetings that are gonna come up and, and there was another question raised about whether or, or what, what can they do on it? They got a blank check. Well, that, that's not the case. They don't have a blank check. The citizens of Sebastian are gonna be the determining factor on what happens on every single piece of that land. The citizens of Sebastian will decide and that is critical to protecting this great community. So everyone agrees it's gonna be developed. Some think the county should do it. Some think Sebastian should do it. I, quite frankly, believe that the people in Sebastian are smart enough to protect themselves. And I also believe that the county has a much broader view when they're looking at these things. The Indian River Lagoon, for instance, has been a high priority and the Sebastian, uh, St. Sebastian River has been an incredibly high priority for this council for the last 20 years that I've been sitting up here, again, council change faces never priorities. We've always had a priority on our environment, restoration of the St. Sebastian River and the Indian River Lagoon. Clearly, this, this council over the years has proven to be the leaders in that regard. Leaders in that regard. The units will be determined at some other time. Council, this is within the annexation area that was just approved by this council. Uh, in the, the annexation reserve area. Interesting thing said about Grant and Valcaria, and this is what, what, what folks need to understand about Grant and Valcaria. They did a good job of protecting themselves inside their borders, but there will be a massive city directly to the west of them that'll have hundreds of thousands of people coming into their city using their boat ramps, using their infrastructure. Hundreds of thousands of people, it's called Emerald City. 10 miles north of here. Those people are gonna be using Sebastian too. So yes, Grand Valcari is beautiful, I love it, but there will be a lot more people in that community very, very soon. I don't wanna get into living on the river and, and saying we shouldn't develop around the river. I won't even get into that. Um, but I'll leave it at this, that the city of Sebastian, or the county for instance, doesn't come to Sebastian and say, we're going to do Blue Water Bay. What do you think of the density here? Um, would it be all right if we did septic? Would it be all right if we require infrastructure? The county doesn't do that for us, never. They just simply go through their process and make the approvals. That's what happened, that's what happens. Now if you look, there's a map, um, I don't know if, if any of you saw the agenda, but there's a map that shows some red stuff directly on the borders of the city of Sebastian where 
I think it's like 1,900 units. Is it 1,900 units? I believe that's correct. 1,900 units have already been approved directly on the southern border of the city of Sebastian. The city of Felsmere has annexed, I believe, all the way down to Route 60 in some areas of the county. Maybe not quite, but certainly over 95. And the land that we're talking about will abut the city of Felsmere. So this development, everyone agrees, is going to happen. I think it's imperative that the city of Sebastian annex this property so that we can maintain our history, heritage, and quality of life moving forward. Now, I'm sure other council members have something to say on this. Mr. Dodd. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, I just want to, I've got a list of things that I heard from the people, and I just kind of want to go down the list. Um, um, first of all, the 2019 uh, revolt that happened in the city over annexation was not really uh, was orchestrated through a gigantic amount of misinformation uh, and a gigantic amount of uh, uh, political uh, political wrangling that I don't know it, 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 I don't know how we fell for that. Uh, there were only about 1,600 people who voted for the three people that were voted in in 2019, and they thought they were going to get a miracle, and they didn't really get a miracle. Um, and I'm I'm just. I'll say this, I know we don't do any politics, and I'm the only person up here who's going to run for re-election this November, and if people don't want to vote me in because I vote for this annexation, so be it. It's that simple. I just That's just the way I feel about it. Um, as far as uh, the environmental issues, I, I completely agree with everything that I heard from uh, from Graham Cox and, and everybody else about environmental issues. I'm, I, uh, people don't realize this, but I'm probably um, I, I'm, I'm a closet environmentalist, um, but I also know practicality of the issue. Uh, let's just think about what happened when somebody in Washington, D.C. tried to put in the Green New Deal, which was a radical, radical attempt at forcing environmental concessions on the businesses and on the economy of the United States. And it fell miserably. They were called communists. They were called everything. Uh, I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that we can't force people to be environmental. We have to teach people to be environmentally sensitive. And the city of Sebastian is actually doing a lot more of that than people want to give us credit for. Our Sustainable Sebastian Initiative is, uh, is moving forward. It, they're, they're accomplishing things. They're just not accomplishing everything at once, which you can't do in a political world. You just can't do that. Um, we have two documents that have been produced on the best practices on controlling pests in the city that are on par with anything done by anybody in the United States, done by this little city of 20,000 people. Uh, we, get, we get comments from people in Oakland, California about these documents and about the stuff that we're doing. So I kind of, in a, in a strong way, I kind of take a little bit of offense when I'm told that Sebastian is not environmentally capable of handling 1,900 acres, and the county is. I don't see any action in the county that makes them more environmentally sensitive than we are. I don't see any action in the county that makes them more environmentally committed than we are. I'm not saying they're not environmentally committed, but I'm saying that I don't see anything that makes them more so than we are. So. It, it's kind of, that, that's, to me, that's almost like somebody is, is saying that you guys just aren't grown up enough to do what you're supposed to do. And I, I, that's what was done in 2019. You're not grown up enough to do what you're supposed to do. So we're going to put people in who are grown up to do that. Well, they didn't put grown ups in. They certainly didn't put grown ups in. And uh, so uh, how do we maintain our small town feel. In the 22 years I've lived here, the city's gone, probably increased their population by 10,000 people maybe, and we still have a small town feel. We, I mean, the people who talk today about the small town feel of Sebastian are looking at it today after increasing in 20 years population by about 10,000 people, which is increasing it by 40 some percent. We still have the small town feel. What makes you honestly believe that 1,900 acres is going to change that if the people up here and the people down there want it to continue. That's also not giving a whole lot of credit to the people who've been involved in this city, just the residents, the leaders, and so forth who've been involved in this city. The small town feel comes because you want it to be maintained. 
not because you maintain it with a moat full of alligators that people can't get over. You don't build a wall around a city and maintain small town feel. Okay, you just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, everyone on the same page, I hear this all the time. I'm, I'm involved in the, um, in the effort with the county. I've been to many of their meetings. I'm, I'm, I actually, interestingly enough, when Commissioner Adams proposed that as, a, as an option to the county commission at one of their meetings two years ago, a year and a half ago, when I was still the mayor, at our very next meeting, their meeting was on Tuesday, on Wednesday night at our meeting, I proposed that the city council of Sebastian allow me as the mayor to write a letter to the county supporting their planning effort. Now, I was the only one on the council who wanted to do that. And, and in fact, I don't think that the county commission wanted us to write the letter either, but I support that effort. I've been very involved in it. I'm a member of the MPO, and I support that effort. But it's not a, that effort is not going to solve all the problems that anybody's got. They're talking about densities. When they talk about cluster subdivisions and they talk about agri-hoods and they talk about those things, what they're talking about doing is taking a density of 10 to 1 acres and putting it in a fourth of the plot. So you do high impact densities in one area in order to save density, in order to save land in another area and make it part of an agricultural thing or make it part of you know, an agri-hood is designed so a, a farming family that has 8,000 acres can build the density that that 8,000 acres allows in 2,000 acres and then continue to farm the rest of it. That's what an agri-hood is. So that's not going to solve our problems. In any way, shape, or form is it going to solve our problems. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a person who believes that the county's a bad actor. I'm really not. But... The stuff that they've approved on our border is going to impact our city dramatically, and we get no tax revenue from that. They, they're in the process of approving right now something in the neighborhood of 14 three-story buildings on Indian River Drive just south of the city of Sebastian on Indian River Drive. Now, do you think the people who are coming down to vacation in those buildings won't use the Main Street boat ramp or the Yacht Club boat ramp? Do you think that the city's not going to have to make improvements to Indian River Drive, to the facilities that we have down there to do that, where we get no tax revenue from it. We get no transportation revenue from the, tra from the transportation um, uh, assessments that they place on the property. We get nothing from that because it's in the county. I'm not saying they're a bad actor. I'm just saying that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. Um, getting everyone on the same page. I would love to have everyone on the same page. I actually brought up the subdivision that they're putting on Indian River Drive to some people in the county a few days ago, and they were amazed that I thought that we have a problem on any river drive, potentially, on that. They were, they slightly, they didn't understand why we thought there was, there would be a problem on any river drive. They were going to do their own traffic study. Were they going to consider the impact of the traffic on the north Indian River Drive when people drive through our boat ramps and drive to this? No. Because that wasn't in their traffic study. It wasn't in the, it wasn't in the area that they were developing. Uh, once again, I'm not saying they're bad actors. I'm just saying that they have their own process, and it's not part of Sebastian to have that process. Um, I, I, think, I think that the people that we're working with on this annexation are, have integrity. They have, they have the best, they have the best uh, wishes for the city of Sebastian. They are going to develop that property, whether it's part of Felsmere, whether it's part of the county, or whether it's part of Sebastian. But they've been, they've been up front from the very day one when we started this process in 2017, I think. And they've been up front. I do agree that we need to do a lot more stuff. I, I'm hoping, Mr. City Manager, that we, that we do the nasty workshop thing with this, that we workshop it to death, that we have more workshops than we know we can do. And I'm talking about between now and September and from September to January and January to December of next year, that we have more workshops than we're comfortable doing. Have them until people quit showing up and get people involved in this, because that was our big mistake before. Quite frankly, the big mistake we made before was not countering in the public all the stuff that was being misstated on social media, but it was impossible to do that because we were under a, uh, we were under a, a, a hush order on it. We couldn't do it. 
So that needs to be that needs to be directed. So I'm in favor of this, and for a lot of reasons, I think it's a good thing. And it's got nothing to do with the county, whether they do a bad job or whether they don't do a bad job. It's got to do with the fact that I think that the city of Sebastian is is capable of doing this, and it's the best thing for the city to do it. Thank you, sir. I agree with Mr. Dodd that <clears throat> the biggest mistake that was made last time was not countering in public the lies. So if a person builds a house next to your house and the city line is in between your houses, do they have the same impact on that community as you do? Yes, is the answer. They have all the impact and no tax base. If we don't annex the property, it's really that simple. That property still affects us in all the same ways that's already been said, and we get zero cents for it, and we have no control on what they do. Not saying they'll do bad things, but for all those people that want to come up and say, agriculture's one house per five acres, I guess haven't driven down 58th and looked at all those orange groves, haven't looked at what Liberty Park, former orange grove, is going to be, haven't looked at Blue Water Bay, former orange grove, is going to be. Last time I checked, there's not one house per five acres there. It's not going to be here if it wasn't us either. Uh, that is the zoning now. That won't be the zoning if they move forward without us. It'll be whatever Fellsmere or the county lets them do. Nobody came to us and said, hey, Mr. Carlisle, what do you all think about Liberty Park? What do you think we should do there? What do you think we should do Blue Water Bay? Hey, do you think we should allow septic tanks in that 40 acres down on the Sebastian River? Or do you think we should make them get septic or sewer? Do you think we should do that? I don't think anybody came to our city manager and asked them that. Sure didn't come to us and ask them that because the county doesn't come to us and ask what they should do. They do what's in their plan. They do what is in their growth plan. We're not part of their growth plan. We're one of the municipalities that has its own growth plan with inside it. Where's the outrage about those buildings being built. We have three environmental groups here tonight. Where's the outrage over those four-story buildings being built? Where's the outrage over that 40-acre piece of property? Where are the environmental groups with the outrage over that? There's no outrage because it's political. That's okay. We'll get there. This is the right thing to do. We're doing the right thing for our city. We're doing the right thing for Sebastian, protecting our city, protecting our residents, building a tax base for property that is going to affect us and they're going to build it whether we like it or not. I would love to see a 1,900 acre environmental park. I don't think that's the owner of the property wants to do. So the question is, can you work with them as we go through the planning process to put some environmental park area in it? Of course we can. 50% of the property has to be open space. We can work with that as we get to the planning stage. This is not the planning stage. This is about whether annexation is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, uh, yes, so I agree with my colleagues on a lot of things. And um, I can tell you that I believe that in order for Sebastian to remain sustainable in the future, we must expand our borders. And I will demonstrate something for you. Barbara, if you could cue that. And I would demonstrate something to you. If you look at the, at the big screen once this comes up, Sorry, can you make that big? All right, so if you look at what's on the screen, the blue section up there, how many people lived here in Sebastian in 1923 when that was all of Sebastian? That was Sebastian, nothing else, just that portion. How many people lived here, right? I don't think there's anybody in here that lived here during that time. There may be uh, relatives, but let's go to the second slide, Barbara. Now this is us after 1960. You see, all of this yellow portion here is annexed land, including the airport in the late 50s that was uh, annexed into the city. So all of this property was annexed into the city of Sebastian. Now we take a look at the next slide. Now we have more. This is from 2009 forward during those years. So you see the growth. And we are sustainable, and we're doing what we need to do here in, in the city of Sebastian. Like I said, I've got one, one more slide here. And now this is where we are in 2022. 
So you see where we started at, this little spot up here, and people say, well, we need to maintain this small village and fishing village and all of that. I think that we like to keep that feel. But Sebastian was very small back then. We annexed property and we grew and we're sustainable. And as long as we have good council people and staff here in this city, I can guarantee you that those properties will be developed to our comprehensive plan, to our stats, the way we want it here in Sebastian and not in Felsmere or the county because if, I, I'm not going to beat that horse. It's already been said about what they would do if they get it or may do with it, but we will be good stewards of this land and I can promise you that we will do the right thing. So I am definitely in favor of the annexation. All right, thank you, Mr. McFarland. I heard somebody say deja vu. Seems a little like Groundhog Day to me. <laughs> now, I might have a little bit of a different perspective on everything, you know? And it's, it's you know, because I went on sabbatical for 10 months and then I came back. So, you know, what I'm looking for, I was in support of the annexation in 2019. I am today. But I would like to see a little bit more. I want to see an annexation agreement before we push this going forward. Because in the three years' time, have we, you know, and I don't care if the county does something and they don't come to us, I think we should still go to the county and let them know. You know what? We are Sebastian, but last I checked, I'm still part of the county, you know? And in attendance, you know, we have Mr. Rheingold, who's the county attorney. He does work for me, you know, and, and Commissioner Flesher has been here for the whole meeting as well. And I think we need to look at that. And, and we haven't talked to the county at all about this. And that was part of, you know, you, you want to counter the naysayers, but what did they say? You didn't reach out to any of the people. Look, I love the animals. I like plants too, but I really love people. Have we talked at a clean water coalition since three years ago? We're looking to do this. Not only are we looking to do what was originally, it's almost double. Have we talked to the Audubon Society? You know who we've left out this whole time is the Sebastian Water District. They might have a big problem with all this that's going on. We never talked to them originally. Now the project is twice the size, as well as the Department of Transportation, 510. We're doing a four laning, which has been going on. I think they would like to know how many homes are going in here. And then, of course, you know, my all-time favorite is, you call it affordable housing, workforce housing. Would the developer be willing to donate a portion of the property and we give it to a nonprofit that can build sustainable housing? I mean, the county was just working with the Treasure Coast Homeless Services Council. The county gave them some property and they got a $200,000 donation from Johns Island Foundation to build a, a triplex down in Gifford. How come we don't have something like that we're looking at? You know, also the other thing is, is if we go forward without talking to all the parties that we have to work with, what is the cost of litigation? If we do the annexation and they're part of us, and now all of a sudden one of those entities want to sue, is it if the, if the county doesn't want to move the urban service boundary, is it the developer who sues for, to move the urban services boundary, or is it the city of Sebastian that has to do that? So I'd like to see an annexation agreement prior to us moving this along. And I would say the other portion is, this is almost exactly the way it was done three years ago, except this first meeting happened in June, and then the following meeting in September, when a lot of the snowbirds weren't here. What's the rush that it has to be done tonight, tomorrow? I mean, this has been three years in the making. That's the only point I wanted to make, is to look and let everybody have their say. And I don't expect the environmentalists or the county or the Sebastian Water District or FDOT, all of us, to be in lock, stop, in agreement, singing Kumbaya, but at least we have an idea of where we're at and where we can go. And I think if we have that prior to going forward, there'll be less people with naysayers. I mean, out of the 15 that spoke, I got about seven that were completely against it. Most were four. So why not do that and do it right? You know, you want to talk about the county does what they want to do. What does that mean? We're just going to do what we want to do? Why don't we do the right thing and involve everybody prior to doing this? What happens is there won't be a house put on there for years from now, maybe 20 years from now. Who's going to know what the possibility? 
I'd like to see some, what is the developer, what are they promising? That's, that's all, and I don't think it's that hard. Okay, thank you. And the good thing is that this is the first step to get into all of those steps that you just described. And I'm so, saying I'd like to see that portion council? prior to moving with this step. All right, wonderful. Anything? <laughs> thank you so much for breaking the rules. That was very kind. <laughs> I will say this, though, all of those things that was just described are part of the process that the other four of us said will happen. So roll call, please. Councilmember Nunn? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Jones? Yes. Councilmember Dodd? Yes. And Councilmember McPartland? No. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. We will now move to, oh, my stuff is a mess now. Where are we at? Where are we at here? We are at item 12B. Resolution number R-22-03, except in the second quarter financial report. Mr. Anand. This is a uh, resolution of the city of Sebastian in River County, Florida, recognizing certain adjustments of the budget <clears throat> for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2021 and ending September 30, 2022, as provided for in Exhibit A. Providing for conflict, providing for scrivener's errors, and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. Carla. Yeah, um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Mr. Kilgore is here to, to present to you the uh, financial report. If you have any questions about it, um, as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Kilgore. Okay, this is the quarterly report that we do uh, each quarter. It did go to the Budget Advisory Board, and they did approve it a week from this past Monday. The uh, short story is, if you like, the shorter version. The uh, resolution includes amendments that, uh, for the most part, what is already approved by the City Council on changes to the budget. That included the American Rescue Plan uh, actions that we took. It also shows adjustments that we're submitting that were <clears throat> relatively minor that used the R&R account. And also the adjustments the city manager has the approval to uh, act on its own. On page 152, you see the summary of general fund that I provide. The good news is, is that we received all of the Hurricane Matthew funds that, were, that we were eligible to receive. We did receive the last of that in this last quarter. And then we were notified there was another $1,900 that we can qualify for, so we've put together the paperwork to file for that, which was on Hurricane Dorian. So I wish there was a day when we could be done with FEMA, but we're still working with them. On the expenditures, expenditures side, it shows a little bit more than 50% of expenditures uh, being incurred. Most of that is because of the first quarter we pay all the pension, uh, police pension contribution that's the, for the city's share, and we pay all the CRA contribution and move it to the CRA fund. At the bottom of page 152, I summarize the American Rescue Plan action that was approved. The news on that is we've received, or we've had those monies for a year now, the one half tranche as they call it. We are due now for the second tranche. I have uh, gone on the U.S. Treasury website and done the necessary application to receive those monies. I expect them any day now. Speaking to some of the other main funds, the stormwater fund, uh, it's a little bit deceiving on the balances that we show or project to be the fund balance at the end of this year because since this budget was, uh, or this, the budget is being modified since this point to accommodate the maintenance of the, uh, the, the mowing contract that we approved where we had price increase. So we've got to adjust for that, but overall the fund is in satisfactory condition. Golf course fund, uh, charges for services, we've collected, uh, our, We've received 80% of the amount budgeted for charges for services at the golf course. Look back at last year, by this time, 
by the by the end of March of the previous year, we had received only 60% of the budget. So things are looking well for the golf course as far as this current year. Airport and building fund, I've got really no concerns there. If you go back to Page 159 is where we provide you a summary of the capital projects that we still have active in the city. It shows that we've only spent 27% of the budgets for those projects, which doesn't sound very impressive, but a big reason for it is the budget side includes $23 million, about half of the budget is for the one project, and that was the canal improvement monies that we uh, projected that we would get a grant and only have to match a, a small portion of that, but that makes those numbers look a little bit worse than they actually are. On page 160, I show the investments, uh, uh, actually where we've got the monies deposited in money market accounts. I also show the interfund loans report, showing you the payments that we are making <coughs> on some of the interfund transactions. At the bottom of that page, I'm pleased to report that on May 1st, we paid off or made the final payment on the stormwater utility debt. And this coming December 1st, we will make the final payment on the paving improvements note that was outstanding. So the only debt that we have at this time are a couple of lease purchase contracts that we've entered into uh, basically for a five month period. Um, the balance of the report, all the information from all the departments and their activities and things that they're working on. Be glad to address any questions. Any questions of Mr. Kilgore? No, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I move approval of Resolution 2203. Second. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Anyone from the public wish to speak on Resolution 22-03? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Item C, repeal the resolution number R2207 and replace it with resolution R2214. Mr. Anand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a resolution of City of Sebastian, in River County, Florida, repealing resolution R2207 in its entirety, authorizing the city manager to execute non-exclusive easements uh, with, with the floor power and light, open print, FPNL, closed print, providing electrical services for two easements. Uh, to provide electrical service to the sewer lift station and, and to the new public works compound on Sebastian Municipal Airport property, providing for conflict, providing for a scrivener's error, and providing for an effective date. Mr. Carlo. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of council, this, is, uh, this resolution, uh, as it states, provides two electrical easements, one on the north side of the public works compound to provide power for that, and one along the south side that supplies power to what will be the lift station it's in to power the lift station for that facility. Uh, the reason for the repeal was the original resolution, the, the description was, the legal description was for the easement to the public works building, but the agenda item and resolution was for the lift station. So we're repealing that ordinance and making them uh, two easements to supply power to that building and lift station. Right, any questions of staff, council? No, sir. Move approval of resolution 2214. Second. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? <coughs> all right. Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Thank you. Now that moves us up to item D, which is the Florida League of Cities items on a point. Mr. Council. Mayor. Yes. I think that Mr. Jones did such a fine job of sitting in on your behalf at the last meeting that he should be appointed the council delegate to that. I second that. And I think Mr. Conference. McPartland should be. I've done many times. I, I've second Mr. Jones. Oh, oh. Third Mr. Jones, that's a consensus of the council. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for your service. Thank you. Uh, does council have any uh, resolutions well, that they would like to consider? You must speak up quicker, Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> does council have any uh, resolutions they want to be uh, submitted to the FLC for FLC matters? Maybe Louise will bring her bell. There you go. To let them know. Resolution. Wake him up. Yep. Well, I, I, I thought about to actually communicate with the city clerk about the 100-year anniversary, but I was a year off, so we have to wait until next year to, to mm. ask them to do a resolution on the 100-year anniversary. There you go. So, yeah. Um, 
but I can't think of anything that we would. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Anand, you are up. Nothing, uh, Mr. Mayor. Bring us some brilliance, Mr. Carlisle. I have nothing further. That was brilliant. Madam Clerk, nothing. Councilmember Nunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, when we sit here meeting after meeting and not many people come, there's always a few people that come. I like to believe it's because they trust us. So when we have an important meeting like this, I would love to think that that trust would carry over that we're going to do the right thing for the city. But then everybody left. So I'm assuming they thought we'd finish the meeting out and not everybody, not too <laughs> important people are still here. But everybody else left, I guess, to assume that we could handle the rest with the trust they've, in, they've given us. So uh, thank you. Yes, and with that being said, we do want the people to come. That's for sure. Mr. Dunn. Okay, I haven't said it enough tonight. I'm sorry, I haven't said it enough tonight, so I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, at the uh, Treasure Coast Regional League of Cities meeting this last week, um, Honey Manu's a uh, member of the Bureau of City Council, asked if the city, uh, if the Sebastian would uh, support HR Bill uh, uh, 7520 by Representative, Representative Mast, which provides some additional funds for the Indian River Lagoon. It, it, it actually brings forward five waters of body in Florida and asks for funds for that. And so I was interested in finding out if the council is in agreement to, for the city manager to produce a letter for, to our federal legislators um, under the mayor's signature uh, in support of that. I have a sample of what Bureau has done that I can send to him and a copy of the bill and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly in favor of, uh, I, I haven't read it, so I wanna take a look at it before I would sign it, but I think that I'm certain um, it, it would be fine. Anything makes, else from council? Makes sense. That? No? Okay. All right. I'll, I'll send the information to, uh, to Mr. Carlisle. Okay. Now, <laughs> not that I have made a big enough mess of myself over, uh, over any river drive, but uh, in my research on, on the topic we talked about tonight, it became apparent to me that um, there's, a, there's a, an open need for us to take a look at a piece of property down on any river drive that's next door to the working waterfront, and that's the simpler piece of property that's for sale right now. Mm. And I... I think that there are an awful lot of, uh, there's an awful lot of synergy between that piece of property and what we currently have down there, and I think that it would be a, a at least the part of it that's east of any river drive would be a great uh, addition to the working waterfront property, and I think we could probably go after some fund grant money to try to bring, make that project a larger and more encompassing. To do that, I would like to see if there's a sense of the council to direct the city manager to at least begin to, to look at that, determine maybe even spend the money to do an appraisal on it and find out if there's an opportunity for us to, to get involved in purchasing that property. Uh, I would intend personally to think that that's our, our, our idea there would be to buy the entire piece of property because I don't think you can get it sub, subdivided for purchase, but at, at some point in time when, it's, when we can do that to sell off the part that's west of Any River Drive and make the part east of Any River Drive part of the overall working waterfront project. Um, the dockage there, the, the people that are using that are part of our working waterfront arena. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's clam people, there's, there's other people that are using that that are having to find a new place to do it uh, because they're gonna be disposed, they're gonna be removed when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when it sells. Uh, there's also, I think, commercial fishermen that don't have enough dock space at the working waterfront right now that might be happy to have some additional dock space there, so. <coughs> That's my request to the council is to see if we can get the city manager to be involved in that. I, I have no problem with that. I think it's. I think the information on that would be great. Uh, we need to do what we can to protect as much of the riverfront property as we have, as well as all the other property in the city. But uh, information is never bad. Nope. So. Yeah, that would be providing that that property is still up for sale. I know it went up, and there may be offers on it right now. Um, not yeah, I'm, sure, I'm, but the other part about the uh, pier that we have that we can also work on extending hours where, where the commercial fishermen yeah. are to extend that dock. Uh, I know you have to go through find and all the other stuff in order to see if if it can be done, but I'm pretty sure we can probably do it. Yeah, extend our dock over there at the Fisherman's Landing. Yeah, yeah there, I mean there's options problem? to it, and it may well be have an it may well have an offer on it. My understanding is that there was an offer on it and it fell through. So I don't know for sure what the what that is, but I would uh, at least we could investigate it, see what could happen with it. Yeah. Sounds good. As, as long as he's willing to sell okay. it to the city, and we can work something out, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the owner is a, a pillar of our community, and I'm sure he'll give it to us at a bare minimum price. Okay. 
And the other Anything thing else? is that I, uh, um, I hope I hope that the people who this evening showed uh, showed some I don't know some feeling that we're not going to represent the city positively. I hope we can we can through our outreach we can get to them and make them understand that we are. And I really hope that. Um, that we extend the city as much as possible on this annexation as far as public outreach is concerned. That we we don't try to go through this process like we did the last time. And I know the last time, quite frankly, we had as many public meetings as people would attend. We had multiple public hearings on each of the steps we went through, but it wasn't sufficient because people people felt like it wasn't sufficient. So. Um, I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm just saying we didn't do the job correctly. I'm just saying that people felt like we didn't do the job correctly, and sometimes that's communication. So we need to make sure that we go out of our way. And I'm kind of directing that to Paul, uh, that we go out of our way to get people involved in this. Yep, I would so, agree with that. Thank you. Nothing else? Well, I thank you very much. I would agree with that. Uh, but I would say that there's, there's going to be people that are always going to say no, regardless of what we do, regardless of how many meetings we have. And I would not be in favor of of workshopping it to death if it's the same five people that are coming in there screaming at us about what the hell we're doing. So anyway, with that being said, uh, the only, I only have one thing. I got a, a letter from the Iraq and Afghanistan War Memorial Foundation. I'm going to pass this on, if it's okay with council, to Mr. McPartland. Uh, Councilmember McPartland's a member of the uh, Veterans uh, Service Council, and it's to it's it's with the, it's a request to construct a an Afghanistan, an Iraq-Afghanistan war memorial, which we already have in Sebastian, but if it's appropriate, I would like to go ahead and pass this on to Mr. Partland. No problems? Yep. Thank you very much. Nothing further. Vice Mayor Jones. You're on for Nothing. It. Thank you. Council Member McPartland. So I guess the one perfect thing, there's one more date left for the land visioning. If you didn't make one and you were interested in how the county should do its vision, Next Thursday, June the 2nd, at Gifford Youth Achievement Center, 9.45 to 11.15 in the morning, and 6 to 7.30 at night at the Gifford Community Center. Other than that, have a safe Memorial Day weekend. It's the last day of school for children on Friday, so keep your eye out in case they're running around in traffic. That's right. it. There being no further business, we are adjourned. <laughs>